I will try to be simple, which is difficult. <laughs> I will do my best. Nice to meet you all. Uh, sit back and relax. And I hope you enjoy the flight for the next uh, half an hour or less. So, I'm sure that you are familiar with all this information that comes through this slide, that neuroendocrine tumors are rare, they may secrete hormones, usually slow growing, may have receptors in the surface, but the most important thing that I want you to get from this slide, that usually neuroendocrine tumors can be treated with more than one option. And this is why we are lucky, that sometimes, or most of the times, we can choose. So the treatment can be individualized. So the physicians, through their meetings, can choose the best treatment between various types for the specific patient. Talking about research, these are the questions I'm going to go through my talk. First of all, what we've got available? What would we need and currently missing? Or what we got recently from the market, from research? What is currently under trials and may be available soon? Or what we could or we, we wish we get in the future? As you know very well, the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumors is based on a good history and examination. Traditional, but if the physician is aware of the disease, it works. It does work. Then we need biochemical tests in the blood and the urine to confirm what we suspect. Of course, we do need high quality imaging studies to reveal the primary site and the spread of the disease. And finally, always we need histology as a gold standard. Not only to be sure of diagnosis, but also to be aware of the biology of the tumor. Why? I will show you. For the physicians, and for those who are aware of the disease, it's usually simple to make the diagnosis if the tumors are secreting hormones. Even from a medical school, we are aware of the carcinoid syndrome, flushing, diarrhea, wheezing, carcinoid crisis during an operation, or if someone has got hypoglycemias, funny hypoglycemias, or recurrent peptic ulcer, or chronic diarrhea, our mind could easily go somewhere related to neuroendocrine tumors. The problem is when the tumor is not secreting hormones. And this is where, and this is how, some of these tumors are usually missed. Okay, we're talking about the non-functional ones. So there's nothing new in the symptoms. Most of the symptoms are there, the problem is that the physician should be aware of the disease to suspect them. You are aware of the test that we are ordering in the blood and in the urine. Some of them are specific for specific types of tumor, and you know the usual bottle, acid bottle, 24 hour urine collection, for patients who are having carcinoid syndrome, we are measuring this substance here, is a metabolite of serotonin, and we usually, usually put the patient on a diet, and we use the fasting gut hormones for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and this calcitonin for medullary thyroid carcinoma. Unfortunately, we don't have specific markers so far, for bronchial carcinoids, for thymic carcinoids. So, 
for these tumors and in general for all neuroendocrine tumors, we use this general marker, which is called chromogranin A. I'm sure that you are familiar with this. And this is a marker for diagnosis and for some tumors can give us prognostic information as well. Prof. Grossman covered this MEN1 syndrome and it's very important for everyone who's been diagnosed with a new pancreatic neurodocrine tumor to have this simple screening for MEN1 syndrome. Why this is important? Because this could alter the patient management and also it will be useful for his family. What's new? What's new in the field of uh, markers in the blood? This. The circulating tumor cells, which is something well known for other cancers, but recently, as you can see this year, on the basis of research in our institution, we saw that circulating cancer cells in the bloodstream could be used as a diagnostic marker in the blood and can also have prognostic implications. An example, we, we know that histology or other markers can tell us how aggressive could a tumor be, but also massive release of a circulating tumor cells in the bloodstream of a patient according to these results, demonstrate aggressiveness of the tumor as well. And this is giving us, I mean the physicians, a clear message. Be more aggressive in these patients when you see massive load of circulating tumor cells. Of course, these are preliminary results. And we need more studies to say clearly or to make a statement that here we are, we found a fantastic new market. But this, these results are promising. With regards to imaging studies, you are familiar with octreotide scan, with endoscopy, with endoscopic ultrasound, with MIBD scan, MRI or CT scan. And that's fine, especially octreotide scan has made a revolution towards demonstration of primary site and metastatic disease, but has got its own limitations. Some tumors which are lacking receptors, especially type 2, may be negative in octreotide scan, or tumors very tiny may be missed. So, as Dr. Lewington said, this is the gallium PET scan who is able, who is able to demonstrate clearly the tumor load and also tell us that a lump which is not very diagnostic in a CT scan is related to the tumor. Whether this PET scan will replace in the, the future the octreotide scan, we cannot be extremely sure yet, but it seems that it is definitely more sensitive. This is an octreotide scan of a patient with neurodocrine tumor. This is negative octreotide scan. This is the liver of the patient. And this patient underwent a gallium, and you can see very clearly, that there are some liver lesions over there. The PET scan also can distinguish lesions from two different cancers. And we know that almost 10% of patients with neurodocrine tumors may have another more aggressive cancer. 
So in this patient who had an operation for a colon cancer and was found incidentally to have a small bowel carcinoid tumor, liver tumors were found. So we didn't know whether these were coming from his colon cancer or from his neuroendocrine. What we did, we did two PET scans. On the left-hand side, it is a gallium PET scan, which is specific for neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see a tumor deposit from his carcinoid. And on the right-hand side, we did on the same patient an FDG PET scan, which is a classical PET scan for aggressive cancers. And nearby, we picked up another lesion related to his colon cancer. So these PET imaging studies, if they are used reasonably, can give us this information as well. Clear so far? More advanced PET scans. This is an FDG PET scan, a gallium PET. The FDG was negative. The PET scan showed only, the gallium PET showed only this tumor. But the more advanced PET scan, Dota NOC, not available in UK, picked up more lesions. So we feel that PET imaging studies is the diagnostic tool of the future in neuroendocrine imaging. And a lot of research is moving towards that direction. Finally, histology. And this is the classification that is currently used based on the tumor states. And I'm sure you are familiar with a marker called ki 67 which is very important information by the histopathologist to the clinicians and tell us how aggressive is the tumor. For those who like movies, I've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good group is this. The bad group is this in the G2, which means that the tumor has got metastatic potential, may spread, and the ugly group is Fortunately, unfortunately, the minority, which is the group of neuroendocrine tumors with high KI7, which behaves like other cancers. Okay, the ugly group. The treatment of neuroendocrine tumors, as you know very well, starts with a very good control of patient symptoms with medications. Okay? As soon as we achieve this, we need to investigate whether, with surgery, we can resect either the primary and, if possible, the metastatic tumors in the liver. And this would be fantastic if it's possible. But if it is not, then we need to find ways to control the tumor growth. And why we do all these things? The target is to provide and maintain a very good quality of life for the patients. And for some patients, quality of life means whatever. But in this patient, quality of life was to enjoy his favorite sport. And this is a picture that he sent to us after his symptoms were well controlled. So. For symptom control, especially in patients with carcinoid syndrome, you know and you are familiar with these famous monthly injections, which can control, as you know very well, symptoms of carcinoid syndrome in the vast majority of patients. But what is happening if the injections are failing? If someone has got continuous flushing or ongoing diarrhea despite maximum dose of these things. 
someone could say very easily, okay, let's escalate the treatment. We can give these magic bullets that Dr. Lewington described, Y90 or MIBG or what else, or we can embolize the tumor. Yes. But any other medications? Yes. We've got now new kits on the block that are coming into clinical trials. And the first one is this. This SOM230. This injection, because this is an injection, is provided by the same company that provides Sandostatin, Novartis, and is actually going against more receptors than the usual Sandostatin. And the study now is ongoing. <coughs> we are still recruiting patients. And the criteria is four flushing per day or four bowel movements per day, despite maximum dose of analogs. This is one study currently ongoing in the UK. And the other medication, brand new, which is again available in studies in UK as well, is this. Very funny name. Telotristat a triprate, but is known now as lexicon study. It is a tablet. What it does, it inhibits an enzyme that produces serotonin, and serotonin is mainly causing diarrhea and flushing. So, so far, and this is a poster presented three weeks ago in the National Conference of Neuroendocrine Tumors in the States, the preliminary results have shown that it is well tolerated and it is achieving at least 30% less bowel movements in patients with ongoing diarrhea as a part of carcinoid syndrome who are using maximum dose of either somatulin or satostatin. Clear so far? So these are the two new drugs for carcinoid syndrome currently on trials, and the trials are still open for patients with ongoing symptoms despite maximum dose of injections. Now, forget symptom control. Let's move to what we are doing to control the tumor growth. We've got all these options. Be careful. One option is to do nothing. Just observe, which is still an option in patients with very, very slow growing tumor and very slow, small volume disease. Okay. Let's talk about the monthly injections. What we thought for many, many years was that these monthly injections were used mainly for symptom control for the hormones. And we were not convinced that these injections can control the tumor growth. Now, we got more data who are supporting this. And this is a study for octreotide LAR, talking about small bowel neurodocrine tumors. And is a randomized study which is very rare, the studies in neuroendocrine tumors because of their rare cancers. So it showed that the drug versus placebo was better to do what? To provide long-term stability. So patients who received that drug had their tumor stable for longer than those who received placebo, who received nothing. And this is encouraging. Give us data to support what we are thinking, that, that we always, the physicians, thinking that these injections probably is helping the tumor as well, but we did not have evidence to support this. Now, this is the evidence. And there is another study with the other drug, somatolin autogel versus placebo in non-functional endocrine tumors, and the results are expected next year. Hopefully the results will be similar to the other study. 
chemotherapy. This is what we know so far. Clear messages from this slide. When we use chemotherapy in neuroendocrine tumors, we use combination chemotherapy. Forget one agent only. This one statement. Second statement is that chemotherapy does not work in small bowel carcinoids. It's pointless. Third statement is chemotherapy does work in the ugly group of neuroendocrine tumors. Remember the slide? Which is the neuroendocrine tumors who are behaving like aggressive cancers. Okay. And this, these are the responses to chemotherapy. Question number one. Have we got any new drugs apart from these classical combinations? The answer is yes. Temozolamide is a new chemotherapy drug given orally. And we have some good data from bronchial neuroendocrine tumors. And some other data came out recently for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So another chemotherapy regimen is based on temozolamide. Third question about chemotherapy is whether we should use it as prophylaxis, as adjuvant after operation. For example, someone has got a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor resected. The question is, even the resection is complete, would we give chemotherapy to prevent recurrence? This question has not been answered yet, but many physicians, when the tumor that they resected is high grade, aggressive, yes, they give some adjuvant chemotherapy to prevent recurrence, but this is not based on studies. This is physician choice. So we do need studies that have not come out yet to see whether it is worthwhile to give chemotherapy as prophylaxis. And the second question is, if a tumor looks inoperable, I'm talking about pancreatic neurodocrine tumors, could we give chemotherapy to shrink it, to make it operable? And for that question, we do need studies. I will present you only one case that it worked. So this is the tumor here in the pancreas, and it is invading a big vessel called portal vein. So on this picture, the surgeons say, I will not touch it. So this patient had chemotherapy, five cycles. The vessels became clear. So the surgeons decided to go in and take it out. But this is only case reports. We don't have, again, studies to support, definitely, chemotherapy prior to the operation, as here, to make it operable, or chemotherapy after operation to prevent recurrence. We still need more data for this. And for all the drugs which are available, or treatment methods which are available to date, I can present you the response rate. Which response? The tumor shrinkage rate. You see? You may say I was expecting bigger numbers. And I always meet in the clinic patients who are anxious about, hmm, can you give me something that can make my tumor disappear? Can you give me the magic drug that can make me feel well, the tumor much smaller? The answer is, is this crucial in neuroendocrine tumors? Or we are happy or happy as physicians if A, we make the patient better, or B, we keep the tumor stable. 
I will show you just one slide. This is a survival curve, real survival, for patients who had radionuclide treatment, not English data, data from Netherlands, but big number, 310 patients. This is the survival of patients who did not respond to this treatment only. And these are the curves of patients who are either have complete response, tumor almost disappearance, median response, tumor slightly smaller, partial response, tumor smaller 20%, and those who have stable disease. And as you can see here, these curves are similar, which means that even if we cannot shrink dramatically the tumor and we provide stability, this is a good response. And be careful, I'm talking about neurodocrine tumors. Why? Please remember my first slide. These tumors are usually slow growing. So even if we can provide long-term stable disease, this is a favorable outcome. And on the basis of these results, the new drugs are coming out in the market. Prof. Grossman showed you this very complicated pathway of how the tumor is growing. What it practically says is this. The tumor, the neuroendocrine tumor, is very clever. Before it grows, it produces more vessels through this very complicated pathway. So what we practically try to do? To find ways to block this ability in certain sites, here, here, or here. So for pancreatic neurotocrine tumors, we are now using the drug sunitinib, which is blocking this pathway here, and another new drug called Everolimus, which is blocking this pathway here. And these are oral tablets. And we have, go, have, have now got new data that came this year, in February, in the biggest journal of medicine in the world, New England Journal of Medicine. And these studies are versus placebo. Remember what I said to you. These drugs did not shrink the tumor dramatically only 9.3% of patients, but they provided stability of the disease. We call it progression-free survival. So patient survives, but the tumor is not growing. So it's stable. So this response is based on stable disease. And for the other drug, the same. Very small tumor shrinkage, but at least double than placebo, maybe more than that, progression-free survival. So the new treatments, although they cannot provide tumor shrinkage, they can provide stability of the disease longer term, which is important. For carcinoid tumors, not the pancreatic ones, some New drugs, again, this bevacicumab, which is blocking that part of the pathway, and again, Everolimus, the drug that I talked before, are now in studies. And as you can see, they are not used alone. They are used in combination of a drug that patients are already on, octreotide. Secret of the future. Probably, probably, the future in neuroendocrine tumors, especially the carcinoids, is combination. 
So we need one drug, octreotide, for example, to control the symptoms. And we may get another drug, like this, to control tumor growth. So combination may be the future. This is a real problem. <coughs> I discuss quite a few times with patients in clinic that the problem in small bowel carcinoids is not only the tumor mass itself, but also the scarring that the tumor is producing. And I give quite often the example of the spider producing its own web. You see the similarity here? This can cause quite a few problems, all these problems, and can make the patient very ill. Unfortunately, so far, we do not have the magic drug that can break this web. What we can do is to operate this tumor early, try to take it out before the development of this scarring. This is one solution. But as soon as the scarring has been established, things are difficult with results to, with regards to the drugs. What have we used is to stent the vessels that are entrapped by the tumor. And this, this is the stent, in a big vessel called superior mesenteric vein. And if it's blocked, the patient develops fluid in the abdomen and swelling in the legs. This can be used in some of these patients, unfortunately, with only temporary results. So this stenting of one of the blocked vessels by the scarring could be used, but the results so far, I can say, are rather disappointing. So still, for this scarring, we haven't got the magic drug. We wish we will get in the future. My favorite topic now, carcinoid heart disease. Patients with carcinoid syndrome can develop scarring not only in the gut, like the spider I showed you, but also in the valves of the heart. Which valves? Usually the right ones. And this can cause problems in the function of the valves. So if someone has got right valves of the heart, non-functioning perfectly, this patient can get swollen legs, shortness of breath, fluid in the abdomen. What can we do? If the situation comes into this stage, and this is the valve of the heart, but it's not a valve, it's just a scar. All this white is scar. Only these tiny bits are normal heart. If we reach this situation, the only solution is heart valve replacement, open surgery. How we can make the diagnosis of the heart disease, carcinoid heart disease? We need a very simple cardiac echo with some jelly eh, outside of the stack. And this is the right valve, tricuspid valve. This is the right ventricle, the right atrium. So usually the blood goes from here to here, but as you can see here, goes opposite, opposite direction. And this can cause the swelling. What we found recently in our group is that we can monitor this patient not only with a cardiac echo, but this through this blood marker, which is very good for diagnosis and monitor. And what we found recently is that brand new imaging studies like three dimension echo and MRI can give us much more information about carcinoid heart disease to reveal early the scarring in the heart. And much more recently, on the base of our research, 
in patients who have severe fluid overload and are not fit yet to go through the valve replacement, we use a similar machine that renal patients are using for dialysis to remove salt and water from the patient body. And through this machine, and the whole pathway is called ultrafiltration, the patient can respond much better to oral water tablets. When we're talking about research in neuroendocrine tumors, you need a very big group, and this is our group. We need to cover various things. And this slide is to demonstrate not that we are good in research, that a lot of things are running in parallel for various types of the disease. Unfortunately, this is the funding that usually neuroendocrine tumors get. This is where we are with regards to funding, and this is all the other cancers. But this is why we are here today, to shout, to say, here we are. This cancer exists. This cancer is underdiagnosed, and we need to push research forward. Clear take-home messages. We need new biomarkers for diagnosis and treatment. Remember the circulating tumor cells, which could be promising. The PET imaging studies are more sensitive than the studies that we know so far. We probably get in the future new studies to assess the severity of carcinoid heart disease. Remember the 3D echoes that I showed you. And with regards of treatment, first message is that new drugs, remember the lexicon study and the SOM230, may be available for a refractory carcinoid syndrome. The second message that we give you today is that the injections, the monthly ones, seems to have more anti-tumoral effect than what we previously thought. The role of adjuvant or neoadjuvant chemotherapy, prophylaxis chemotherapy, for example, needs to be assessed through trials. New drugs, remember the pathway, with the blockage, seems to be promising pancreatic neurotocrine tumors. We still await to hear that these drugs can also be helpful in carcinoid tumors, non-pancreatic ones. And unfortunately, there's no successful treatment so far for scarring in the mesentery. But the most important thing is research is ongoing. And with this, I thank you very much.